But for our purposes, it's more important to notice that Howard always gives equal weight to his customers and his employees. I mean, partners. I view them interchangeable. We can't make our partners proud if our customers are not, and we can't make our customers proud if our partners are not. This viewpoint is far from universal today, and it was much less common when Howard took the reins in Starbucks in the late 1980s. His board members at the time didn't quite know what to make of him. What do you, what do you mean? The, what, what are you talking about? This isn't working. You're losing money. Howard and his archetypical friends haven't always sat easily with the shareholders. But Howard keeps bringing these two groups together. The origin story of those archetypical friends goes back to a very real and searing experience from his childhood. He grew up in public housing in Carnassi on the eastern shore of Brooklyn. My father was a uh, World War II veteran, high school dropout, and came back from the war with yellow fever and unfortunately ended up really not realizing the aspiration of the American dream he thought he was going to come home to after the war. He was a delivery driver picking up and delivering cloth diapers before the invention of Pampers. And in March of 1960, on a delivery, he fell on a sheet of ice and fractured his ankle and broke his hip. The injury caused him to get fired. No workman's compensation, obviously no health insurance. When I was seven years old, I literally came home from school, opened the apartment door, and saw my father laid out on a couch with a cast from his hip to his ankle. Listen, at the age of seven, how could I possibly understand the impact that would have on me? But it, it scarred me to watch and witness my parents and my mother just go through such a hard time. As I got older, I think I've always been sensitized to people living on the other side of the tracks. And as Starbucks evolved, I think I was trying to build the kind of company my father never got a chance to work for, a company that would try and balance profit with conscience. Notice his phrasing here. He wants to balance profit with conscience, as if too much profit will strain his conscience and vice versa. And there's some truth to that, but it's not the whole truth. Profit and conscience are neither enemies nor friends. They're frenemies. You have to be creative about how you bring the two together. Howard didn't put benefits ahead of profits, but he didn't put profits first either. He started tackling both problems simultaneously. When we sat down to talk, I asked him how he took his very first steps. Because of your experience at home with your father, did you say from the very beginning the way that we're going to think about employees is as partners? Well, what did the startup part of that journey look like? I have many of these old journals that I kept. I wrote something early on about the business plan of this new company was going to be to achieve the fragile balance between profit and conscience. And then underneath that, I started thinking about what does that really mean? What's important to understand is that we had no money to build a traditional marketing or advertising or PR. We had none of that. And so we defined the brand by the experience in our stores. And we said early on that the equity of the brand would be defined by the managers and leaders of the company exceeding the expectations of our people so that they could exceed the expectations of the customer. And because coffee is so personal and it's frequent, we had an opportunity to create an intimacy with the customer that built the equity of the brand. 